lot of more people tend to show up. If they do, we'll see what happens then. <laughs> Someone fleeing the room. <laughs> Okay, welcome at the Dutch NL, uh, NLIGF second panel of this day. Um, I think that part of the reason it's so empty, it had a very strange title for one reason or another we couldn't change. So welcome to the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs open forum. <laughs> and the real title should have been, and it was up here, breaking down silos in, in cyber cooperation and a little bit more. Um, I think what we're going to do is make this as interactive as possible and discuss some best practices and examples. And if you have questions, we're going to try to have them answered. Well, wh where did this come from? We had a session last year that was under the title of Cybersecurity Incidents and Cooperation. And Chris was on there, for example, and I'll introduce the panel in a moment. And we came up with some excellent recommendations. And when we discussed that after, we came home, we decided to pick two out. The first session we had this, they had this morning on cybersecurity. Now we're going to do cooperation because what happened in that panel is that people said, yes, we need to cooperate, we need to break down silos, but at the same time recognize that for an individual organization, it's very hard to break down silos because it's not in the remit, it's not the task they get from government. And it's certainly not a task to say to the government, wait a minute, we can't really cooperate. We're not allowed to do things cross-border. We're not allowed to give personal data to another organization in our own country. So in other words, how are we going to deal with that? And is that being dealt with in practice at the moment? And that's the sort of pract best practices that we're going to try to show here, reflect on that, and perhaps take away a little bit of the myth of privacy and see if, if everything is privacy sensitive data in, in, all, in all instances. I'm going to introduce the panel. First, I have to say that Thorsten Kraft of ECHO, who was going to present on the ACDC, the, the, the botnet mitigation program of the EU at the moment, is, is ill and had to cancel. He asked me to say a little bit about it, so if the right moment is there, I'll reflect on it for two minutes. But because I'm the moderator, I will not take any questions because then we get sort of the wrong side of roles here. So I'm going to introduce everyone. I have Christopher Painter, Secretary of State in the US. <laughs> State Department, sorry. <laughs> State oh, sorry. De I said it yeah. the same last year. <laughs> sorry about that, Chris. Robert van Hussel, who's a young entre internet entrepreneur and student from the Netherlands. Astrid Ozenbrug from the Dutch Parliament. We have Mike Nelson from Microsoft. We have Ariel Akplogan from Afrinik. Nina Jans of the Ministry of Security and Justice, and Martin Simon of the SIDN, the .NL domain name organization in the Netherlands. So we have a broad spectrum of government, entrepreneurship, international organizations, and commercial parties. So let's start with, do we know any best practices in breaking down silos? who's actually working on that in cooperation with somebody else than your own organization and managing to exchange data between each other. Who would like to go first? And the mics are on the table, so please pass them around. No, anybody. So who's actually working on the best practice in data exchange? <laughs> Okay, well, that's it. Martin will we'll kick off. <laughs> okay, it does work. Um, yes, well, first of all, I'm, I'm Martin Simon. I work with SIDN. SIDN is the registry for the .NL domain names. So we're the national registry or something like that. We're non-governmental. We're a private entity, uh, foundation. And um, we run the .nl domain for, um, um, well, in, not for the Dutch government, but uh, in the end for the internet user, the Dutch local internet user. And um, 
So, but I'm not here to talk about domain names because that's I know a lot about that, but that's not the point here. Um, but uh, we have an example now that we um, started, I think, uh, last year. To we we set up uh, an organization together with um, a number of ISPs in the Netherlands to uh, mitigate botnets and. Um, it was, the, the ISPs were talking already for a few years together to set up something like that, and the idea was quite simple. You uh, get a lot of information you, about botnets, you find out which uh, of your customers is um, uh, infected, and you, uh, well, inform them. That's basically the idea, and it seems quite simple. Uh, but it wasn't so simple to set up, because one of the problems, of course, is, is finance. You have to um, set up an organization, uh, 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 make some software, and things like that. Um, and um, with the help of uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and SIDN, which is not an ISP, so we're, we're not an internet access provider, um, we set up this uh, this organization. It, it took some uh, some some years, but in the end, it, we succeeded, and uh, it will go live very soon. Okay, but then you're the domain name organization, the .nl organization. What made you guys say, well, botnet mitigation is something we want to be involved in? Well, um, we are the domain name registry, but we also have in our goals that we want to make the internet. <coughs> uh, safer, more trustworthy, and we invest um, in, the, in that purpose by um, sometimes donating money to organizations that we support, um, for example, on, on online privacy. And um, for example, uh, we, we are one of the sponsors or one of the uh, parties behind the .nl IGF and um, and there are thing, more things like that. So um, we got involved. Uh, we, we knew that the discussion was going on and that it, well, it was going on and on and on. And, um, and we got in contact and we, we understood the problem and we have the means so we could make the investment. And it's interesting for us because we were able to broaden the scope to also uh, hosting providers they are not members yet, but the idea is that they can become members in the future. And um, so we think it's a good initiative and we wanted to support it. And we will also um, maintain the systems. So that's a lot of multi-stakeholderism, what I'm hearing. Mike, you want to reflect? Yeah, uh, uh, let me first give a little context as to why I'm here. Uh, I've been with Microsoft for about two months, but the reason I was tapped to be here, even though I've only been at Microsoft for a few few weeks, is because of my background. Uh, I spent 10 years in government, including in the Clinton White House, working on cybersecurity issues and a range of cyber issues. And then I spent 10 years at IBM before going to Georgetown University, where I teach internet studies. And so I've got a lot of different perspectives on this. And one of the first things I learned in my first job in Washington when I was working for Senator Gore and Senator John Kerry and other Democrats on the Science Subcommittee, is when ask a question, answer an even better question. So I'm going to twist your question and say, what are the worst practices? And I've seen some of those. And in particular, give us the top three. I was just going to give you the top two. <laughs> okay. um, the first assignment I got when I got to the White House, literally day two, was encryption policy. And I showed up, and the vice president had just been briefed by the National Security Council on clipper chip. And some of us remember that. And, and what needed to be done about export controls. And what was interesting is that the vice president immediately said, after he heard that, go brief Mike Nelson about this. And the NSA and the National Security Council said, we can't brief him. He's not cleared. He doesn't have a top secret clearance. Now, the vice president said, get him a top secret clearance. And I had lived a clean life, and within three weeks, I had a top secret clearance. 
but that, that I think is, the, is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have in this whole area of cybersecurity. We have these incredible barriers, both government classification and business classification. And this third issue that's coming in is silos created because we need to protect private personal information. Those three together make it very hard to address some of the serious cybersecurity problems we have. But I think of those three, the biggest one is, is the government classification. And in many cases, we're over-classifying, we're, we're, we're limiting the number of people who can get access to the information that they need to design better systems, to address cybersecurity threats, to address cyber vulnerabilities. So that's my, that's my first worst practice. Chris, you wanted to reflect anyway, so here's the, here's the blame on you, uh, actually, as government. So. So, so just a couple things. First of all, I should say I want to congratulate the Netherlands on, uh, I just came from the Seoul Conference on Cyberspace, which was the third iteration, started in London, then in Budapest last year, then in Seoul, Korea this year, and the Netherlands is hosting the next one in early 20, or sometime in the uh, first part of 2015, not exactly decided. Uh, and the organizer uh, will be, and the person appointed to, I suppose my role, is your former foreign minister, Uri R R Rosenthal, who uh, also launched the Coalition for Freedom Online when he was foreign minister, so now he's taking the helm of getting back into cyber issues. So I want to congratulate the Netherlands on that and look forward to that being a really good event. Uh, as far as, uh, and, and indeed, uh, meetings like that, just like the IGF, can be a way to break down some of these silos if you get the right stakeholders there and the right focus. Um, one, one thing I want to talk about is uh, in the U.S. there has been a lot of attention uh, around how you can share actionable information between industry and government. Uh, and everyone talks constantly about public-private partnership, uh, you know, a term that's so overused that it's practically devoid of meaning now, that, you know, what does that mean? And to me, it really does mean sharing information both ways that both sides can use. Uh, and government certainly needs the information to help look at the threat picture and do the things that certs do. Uh, the industry needs the picture, and, and uh, not just the, the private sector, but society as a whole needs the information to be able to better protect themselves. So uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, there was a, a project that was focused first on the defense industrial base that tried to share information, uh, signatures of attacks and other kinds of information with uh, those uh, trusted entities. And now there's, and that worked fairly well, and it was done more at the ISP level. Um, and now uh, uh, our Department of Homeland Security is working to do that with other uh, sectors as well. So that's a work in progress, but it's an example of giving something the government might have unique access to uh, that will help the private sector uh, and trying to do it in a way that's scalable by working with the ISPs. And I think that's a good you know, practical example. It's, it's, it, there are other ways where information sharing could work and you could break down silos, like bringing other stakeholders into the policy making process, that's really important as well as you build things like incident response plans. But that actionable sharing of information is pretty important, I think. Thank you, Chris. I think Nina, the, you can expand on that, I think, from an example from the Netherlands, which people start to call the Dutch model. Yeah, the Dutch are quite famous for their consensus based policy or decision making. It's called, it actually has a word in Dutch, I don't know whether it's English, but poldering. poldering. Um, we try to engage as much actors in a policy process as possible, so that includes politicians, of course, that's the legislative process, uh, but not just private sector, also civil society. So what we're recently working on and will be published on the 28th of October is uh, our new updated national cybersecurity strategy, which is formed by this inclusive process. We had several multi-stakeholder meetings um, what should we focus on since the first strategy that we, we published and what should be the actions forward? Because I agree with Chris that public-private participation or, sorry, public-private partnership as we used to call it, uh, it has to evolve into public-private participation. We have to go from just discussing things to acting on things and really acting out in a concrete way. So the example that Martin just mentioned on um, uh, the cooperation model with our ISPs on, on botnets. Um, I think that is one of the more pri public-privately driven initiatives that 
could be followed in several different uh, policy areas as well. If I take it from the government perspective, uh, we, as the Ministry of Security and Justice in the Netherlands, we coordinate the whole of government approach on cybersecurity. Um, we do that internally with the public sector, but of course we also try to engage our partners uh, from other areas, multi-stakeholder, not just private, also academia, also uh, civil society, NGOs, um, in our operational um, arena. So we have the, the, the former GovCert, which has turned into the National Cert and has actually this flexible pool. So it it's, has become the National Cybersecurity Center. It's linked to um, the ISECs, of se uh, the, the information and sharing information sharing and analysis centers of several sectors. Um, there are academia that are visiting us every two weeks and we've connected this center to my policy department. So we moved into one building this summer and I'm trying to really understand this tech language all the time. So I think these are examples of how we are really getting across borders and we should continue on those. Is, is there an example of a case you actually done so far together with all these different stakeholders? We're working on several cases, um, basically on, a, I guess, daily slash weekly basis. Uh, the first one where we, we already had an ICT response board, uh, which is a um, partnership where we have mm, CEO level or, a or yeah, um, CIO level participation in case of an incident where we need advice and they were actually called in when we had the uh, DigiNotar case in 2011 to solve uh, quite a crisis in the Netherlands, uh, you can say. Yeah. And we've learned from that. It's, it's, it, we, we should have taken it for, or since then we've been taking it further and this ICT response board is uh, a, man a way, a manner to, to yeah, respond in a multi-stakeholder way to a, to a secu yeah, security incident. Thank you. Ariel, I think you're also in the multinational arena. So what do you run into when you break down silos? Yes, uh, it, it, it can look uh, obvious for us because we are an international organization and you know by default we work with uh, um, uh, operators locally and, and different stakeholders locally. And by default our m o operation mode or policy development mode is multi-stakeholder by nature. Uh, but however, it, w when it comes to cyber security and cyber crime, it, 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 it has some challenges uh, to which we, we need to look at uh, very closely. Um, you were um, talking about sharing information, for instance. We, we have a public uh, who is database where um, uh, operators must register or record um, all information about IP address and, and, their, and, their, and their usage. Uh, now, one thing is to have those information uh, registered in a public database. Another, another thing is to be able to access them or use them meaningfully in, in, in this investigation. And in our region, you know, uh, the, the, the cyber investigation and all around it is still new for, for several law enforcement. So uh, <clears throat> one of the problems that we face is, is not um, yet very accurate at the, at the data sharing, but how to meaningfully use the information that we put, we make available. So at the very beginning of Africa, we had a lot of challenge um, directing law enforcement and, and government agency to, to the information. Uh, the, the systematic turn to us as Afrinic to help them through the information to, to find the information. While in our mission is not to uh, really um, uh, provide the information. That's why the information is public. They, they, they must be able to find the information themselves and then track, track it down. So <coughs> we, we have done several things. One thing we, we are doing is to try to work with law enforcement agency locally and train them. On, on what, uh, who is the is, is, and how it works. What are the options? How do you uh, refine your your search on the, on the on, in the database? Um, and we are going even further by trying to um, um, uh, design um, a tool that can be used by anyone, but among other by, by other who, who, are, who are looking for for this information. The second thing that we have done to to, to make this more um, a kind of um, a scalable is to create what we have called the government working group. But honestly, it started with 
uh, first thing, um, um, law enforcement agency group who approached us to, to discuss on our policy mechanism, how our policy are defined, how, how the usage of the public database is, 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 is defined and um, what we can do together to make those information accurate. So it, it's, it's a close by invitation group by now where we discuss with government, but also with law enforcement agency on those challenges that they have and how we can work together to make sure that the information is, is accurate. We as registry, we cannot set a rule and, and legislation on that, and we operate at a very global level. But uh, what we keep telling them is that you have to really well understand how the policy development pro process is so you can work locally with your stakeholder locally, uh, your ISP, your um, um, network provider locally, so to understand how to maintain information in our database and how that will make your life easy because no ISP want to be contacted because somebody uh, uh, on their network or on their customer has botnet or has, uh, is hosting a criminal uh, a server. They want the person directly to be contacted. But if you don't provide the accurate information in the database at the first place, you are exposing yourself. So <clears throat> sharing those kind of knowledge and information about how to use that is helping. But um, we have 54 countries with 54 legislation and 54 <laughs> different uh, person to deal with. And, and that is where the challenge is, how to, how to access people who have that interest and access them and provide them the information in a very sustainable way. We have that as well, the, the, the stability of people who are dealing with those issues so that they can keep the, conti the continuity. So then for you, breaking down silos work both ways, or more yes. than both ways even. So that's a good example. Thank you. Mike? Just a couple of quick other points I'd like to make. Um, before joining Microsoft, I did some consulting with the Leading Edge Forum, which is a, a, a group, a, a think tank within CSC. And I wrote a paper on creating your transparency strategy, listing how companies and government agencies have decided to be more open about what they're doing and what techniques they use to do it. One of the key pieces of that is building your systems so that you can manage the sharing and audit the sharing. So one thing that we're working on in the technology policy group at Microsoft is what we call trustworthy data management. So you could imagine a spreadsheet where different columns have different rights, and you're able to know who actually looked at those different columns. Now, we have systems like that, but they're designed for certain intelligence agencies, and they cost 100 times more than a spreadsheet. We need some very simple to use tools that allow us to share information and know who's got it and know what they've done with it. And luckily we're working on that. And we need the auditability to go back. Um, the, the Bradley Manning case is an incredible example. Uh, the story behind that was there was a clear need to share information. A small contractor, not Microsoft, built this great system that helped agencies share information in a secure environment and they did it as a pilot project. And very quickly, everybody wanted to use it. At that point, the contractor came back to the agency that had contracted with them and said, you know, we don't have proper security because this was a pilot project. We were just manually looking at the logs of who was looking at what to see, to do a manual audit. And the logs were now, you know, that much paper every week. And that's why Bradley Manning wasn't noticed, because they didn't invest the money to go back and do the mechanical audit, use some artificial intelligence to see who was looking. That can be done. And the kind of sharing that that system enabled was necessary. It's still necessary. But because of what's happened, they've now put the silos back in place. So this is really important. The last example I wanted to use was Y2K. Uh, I was in the White House. And about 1996, one of President Clinton's close friends came to him and said, President, the world's going to come to an end, and it's going to be your fault. <laughs> and of course, Bill Clinton had delegated all this digital stuff to my boss, Vice President Gore. And Gore came to me and said, what's the president need to know about this? And I wrote the first briefing for the president on these issues, very short. Basically, the bottom line was, this shouldn't be too much more complicated than going from DOS to Windows. 
It's a, you know, it's billions of dollars, it's not trillions of dollars, and it's not the end of the world. I was really interested in what happened on the last day of the last millennium. <laughs> but in that case, we did something really smart. Uh, Bruce McConnell, who was a close friend, was in charge of the international Y2K effort within the US. And what they did there was they let everybody know this was a, a penalty-free exercise. You know, you weren't going to be held accountable if you were behind on your effort. You know, just tell us what's going on. In a lot of other efforts, when they, when they try to do something, people get, you know, they, 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 they report something, it doesn't look good, they have to do three more reports. Well, with Y2K, there wasn't time. So they just made it very simple, very simple reporting requirements. Everybody just went out and moved as fast as they could and let everybody else know what was going on. And that's what we need to do more of. I mean, too often we get in these bureaucratic cycles where everybody has to tell everybody what they're doing all the time, and then when there's a glitch, there's five more reports. It has to be simple and clean. And that's, I think that's the most important thing we do when we design uh, information sharing systems. Okay, maybe that's the right moment for me to put down my moderating chair cap and put on the ACDC one for two minutes. Uh, as I said, Thorsten Kraft of uh, ECHO, the German internet service provider, is ill and could not make it to, to Bali today. Um, to go short, ACDC stands for um, Advanced Cyber Defense Center, and it's an EU public-private project on botnet mitigation. Uh, to tell it in very short words, one half is on establishing national support centers which are going to help the end user disinfect the computer, their computers or devices. The other half is establishing a pool of data on botnet and malicious traffic and analyze that, enrich it with other information so that perhaps from behind the data that will become patterns clear so that actually the people behind the botnets and assisting the botnets knowing or no, uh, not knowingly to drive that back and make it a little bit harder to operate botnets. As I said, it's a project for uh, that runs for over two years and it started in February, it will end in August and people that are interested can give their car to me and I will pass it on to Torsten so that he can actually get into contact with you. And I'll leave it with that because as a moderator it's very hard to discuss uh, the topic as you can understand it. And I hope I said it well for him. Um, putting my cap back on as moderator. Um, we've been talking about the best practices at the moment and we've seen several of them. Uh, uh, the other thing is that it's, people on the panel said it's actually very hard to do all this data sharing. And let's go and see whether that, that is true or not. From your personal experience, do you actually share data, for example, from private to law enforcement or from law enforcement to, to, to private or between each other and help each other solving cases or solving and mitigating problems in the private sector. So who would like to kick off with, with that? Is it difficult or yes, it is possible on the circumstance? Yeah, it, it is uh, difficult because the problem is uh, people lost their trust somehow. So we have to get, uh, try to find the trust back so you can start sharing information again because you really need to break down the silos. You also need to get the trust back. So uh, for the government, I know uh, they are uh, using data between uh, companies and, and, and what the government uses, but they uh, use it as open data. So that's sharing data, and maybe th that's the way uh, we can learn again to trust each other again, because if the, uh, the government starts to put out data, open data, and uh, companies can use the data, and in a good way, people can see, from, well, there's also a good thing in sharing data. So maybe that's a good start to uh, breaking down silos, the way I see it as I talk to people, and I talk to companies, and I talk to ministers. So. Let's go to the youth view on sharing data. Is that something we we're going to talk about, Robert, in 10 years from now, or will it just go away because everybody's sharing data already? What do you think? Well, personally, I, I really believe in sharing data since there's a lot of uh, things you can do with valuable data. 
But uh, when it comes to breaking down silos and, and um, different companies working together uh, or the companies and governments working together, uh, I got triggered uh, since Elstrid mentioned the word trust. And um, when you are in a relationship and you have valuable information and uh, the other one in the relationship asks for this information and you're not sure whether or what he or she is going to do with it, you probably won't share it. Um, but over time, when you get to know someone better and start to get a deeper understanding of how someone thinks and what somebody wants, it becomes way easier to share more valuable information. When you translate that to organizations, what I really believe, if you want to break down silos, you first have to start um, uh, get connected with each other on uh, a non-information level. It's about sharing knowledge, it's about sharing visions, about how to work with data. It's about uh, sharing information, about storing safe data. Uh, for example, the story you mentioned about like a, a spreadsheet where we can see who, look at, who actually uses the data. It's a very good example. Um, and you can bring it to ISPs, you can bring it to different companies, to the government, all kinds of organizations that have a lot of data. And once you start to share knowledge and visions about data and, and the way you work together, um, over time, there will be a point that you start to understand why it's valuable to share certain information, the way um, the ISPs and uh, ISDN came together. I'm sure it worked like that. It wasn't like, hey, I'm just gonna to ask them to, to uh, help with this project. So, um, this is in building trust, but if you look from the consumer's perspective, there's just one concern I want to raise, and um, I know that's very opposing for, for uh, this, um, I think, very progressively uh, session, is um, when I share data with a company because I love them, because I'm, 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 I know uh, what the purpose is of the information I share with them. For example, Facebook. And, um, I might have no problem at all when, when uh, governments use these data. But I trust Facebook to share this data with the government if they do it in the right way, when I trust Facebook. So I trust Facebook to share data in such a way that they don't, um, uh, uh, don't bring me into trouble. So but, but, but if they do anyway, because they're in the US, there's a different law. No, no, no. And do you give up Facebook? Or will you continue Facebook? Well, it, it surely uh, brings damage to my relationship with Facebook. But um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about sharing all the data. I'm, sharing, I'm talking about sharing data that's actually valuable for the, uh, for the government. Because I sometimes have the feeling that government and secret agencies, etc., they look at all these companies and startups and, and they're like, oh my god, they have so much data, I want some of it, you know? I want to play around with it. And, and it's not very purposeful to uh, then, by, with a gun at the head, ask for this kind of information. But once the purpose is clear and Facebook understands uh, why, uh, why certain governments need certain information, I totally trust them with it. If they need, if they need the transcript of my chats because they want to know uh, what location I was because there was a, a fight and probably they could use me for, uh, to ask some more questions, you know, they saw at my location, I was having a chat uh, somewhere in the park, and uh, in the corner of the park, somebody was robbed. I mean, this is in 10 years, this is the kind of information they could have. I have no problem with the police knocking at my door to ask some questions so they can find the actual criminal. You know okay. okay, thanks. Let's, let's look at it from a different perspective, yep. Martin. Martin. Um, you're a private company, you have a lot of personal data. Does trust come into it when you share data with police or other uh, other organizations or has it got nothing to do with it? Uh, that's a difficult question, thank you. Um, does trust play a role? Yes, trust plays a role. Um, but I have to mention that uh, most of the public personal data we have is already publicly shared. So that makes it a bit strange because we have the WIS function and I don't know if everyone knows it but we publish the names and addresses of all uh, .nl domain name holders so that's already public and we in the, in the well um, since it's a bit problematic legally in, in, in a privacy law sense uh, we limited the information in, over the years and now we don't show addresses anymore 
and uh, government agencies can sign a contract with us to to get this information. And um, in the contract, of course, we say that they can only use it for certain things and if they have the right to ask us. But there's, well, we're Dutch, so we trust our government some sort of, and we never check what they do. But, of course, we, we have a, a rate limiting on it. So we know that they can't take more than, let's say, 100 a day or so. But that's it. Mm. And that's, that's, that's based on trust, but it's, it's a bit typically Dutch, I think. No, thank you. Uh, Asset, we had a discussion, I think, last night, mm -hmm. and you said, well, there's these systems that the police are doing by the millions uh, a, a year. How does that compare to real investigations they do? Do you have concerns on that? So there's open data on privacy-sensitive uh, data? I have concerns uh, that it's not uh, <clears throat> that I ca cannot do my job. My job is to uh, control the government. That's my job, mostly. So if they, the police uh, go and go uh, into data, and I'm not sure, uh, or I can't look what they are doing, then I don't trust them. So we need laws about it. So now we are making a law what the police can do or can do, and. I trust, the, and then my trust will be back, because then I can control. I need control, I need trust. That's the two things I need, so. And the story about, maybe it's, uh, the, I'm, I'm more a, a, a privacy lover, I guess, because I would never want the police to find me on Facebook to say you were there at that moment, and maybe you are a witness, because that would really scare me off, so that. It's just something I wanted to say. Just a real quick bumper sticker. Um, in this report on transparency, I talked about the need for mutually assured disclosure. I'll tell Facebook, I'll tell the government information, but you're going to tell me what information you have collected, and you're going to tell me what you're doing about it. We've got a very good model for this in the U.S., the Fair Credit Reporting Act, where we have a very well-established system for rating my credit worthiness based on all my financial transactions, but I have the right to know what data they have, and I can even see who's accessed that record each quarter. Uh, I want to go to Chris and then the UADL. Um, I've spoken to several organizations recently in the Netherlands who said I'm not going to share any data with the U.S. anymore. So is there a sense of trust that is gone, and how can we reclaim the trust because it's been there before June, quite regularly, I think. Well, I, I, think it, I think it would be a mistake not to rebuild that trust because the, the whole point of the operational sharing of information is to really combat threats and to help uh, in, in this area and help with cybersecurity. So, uh, you know, I, I think that would be a very short-sighted approach to take that approach. I think that, you know, there are a lot of uh, controls and protections in place. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I would hope that that doesn't, Persist. There's always been this issue, though, uh, and I think everyone has seen this in their 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 own uh, experience. That there's always a lot of there's always been reticence between uh, the private sector to share information with the government, and really vice versa. I mean, that's nothing new. Um, and part of it is not an expectation of what the information is going to be used for, how it's going to be used, and what the capabilities of each side are. So, in the area of cybercrime, you know, people. Uh, there's always been this underreporting problem, for instance, where people haven't reported the, the actual incidents. And that's been based on sometimes a fear that the uh, law enforcement authorities would further victimize the victim. Sometimes it was based on a misunderstanding of, well, what can law enforcement do for me anyway? They're not going to do anything about this. So partly this is an education and confidence building uh, exercise as well, I think. I think are the only ones on Respond because how does trust work between all the African nations? With the 54, I understand you said, how does it work? Oh well, <laughs> no, it's not working. <laughs> and just put it that way. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, trust in the digital world is even worse than trust in, in physical because because in the digital world there is no, there is there is more difficulty um, um, controlling or, or following what is being said. I mean, I'm, I'm more. I'm happy to talk to the police when they, they ask me down on my back uh, more than what I can tell them is, is shared, and, and I'm not even aware. That, that, that is where the, where the worry com, comes from. And 
And, and moving from that real world to the digital world in a region like, like Africa where um, um, the, the, the internet is becoming, uh, or, or the, the region is embracing internet now is even more difficult. Uh, and, 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 and recent event doesn't even make, make, it, make it easier because the, 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 the thing is, uh, as you mentioned, is the confidence. Uh, I want to share, but I want to know that what is the information we, which, which is there, what is being used for, and then people, people, people will be able to share. And on top of that, there is, a, there is a, the issue, and in, in our region we are saying is about the, um, <coughs> the, the regulation or the, the, the legislation framework, global framework on that. Um, because, you know, um, somebody in the, in the remote um, um, DRC uh, who's using his computer doing thing and, and um, has no way of going behind Facebook about what he is sharing in, under his own legislation. However, if it is a local company, he may have somebody that can help him locally to. to so there is a there is a uh, a need, a very critical need to uh, reveal the trust based on some transparency on, 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 on that area. And I think that's what we should aim at. And, and that's where, again, the uh, multi-stakeholder, multi-interest group uh, participation is, is very critical um, locally, but globally. Sometimes it's even more easy to at certain level globally to have this kind of thing. But taking the what is global and applying it locally uh, and, 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 and creating the link can be very, very difficult. And, and we need to work, work probably on, on that aspect. But you use the word transparency. I think that may be a solution to some of the things that are happening uh, at the moment. Uh, could you reflect on that? How could organizations or should the government be more transparent? How do you envision that? I think transparency has, has different um, uh, level, uh, and that is that, that is the real world. And, and if we transfer translate that into the digital world, it, but but at at, at least uh, people must be um, people, company, government must know exactly on which framework. Uh, uh, sharing of information is happening, for instance. Um, what are the, the, the limits? What are the use? And if that use can, user can change, or the need for sharing can change. And that's what policy is about. You can, I, I mean, you can change it at any time to adapt it to the situation. You can make it more straight, more, more relaxed. And I think that transparency and making letting people know that, well, okay, uh, this is what is being done, this is what is being shared, can even help them help in this case. And we have seen several cases recently where uh, investigation has used public information. I mean, crowdsourcing is, 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 is one, and, and, and in different, different aspects, where, where voluntarily people share information because they know what they are aim, aim, uh, aiming at. How, how can we make that more um, in a more formal framework? Is, is probably the Thank you. Robert would like to respond, and then Nina. And if there are any questions in the room, this is supposed to be uh, interactive, so please oh. alert me oh. to, oh. yeah, you were late, it's your fault, Ludo. <laughs> but if you have any questions, please alert me, because I will certainly come up to you, and so you can ask a question or make a comment and participate. But Robert. Okay. Cool. So, um, uh, I, I totally agree with you about the transparency part, because, um, when I, when I taste the fear of, oh, well, the police knows a lot of information and probably they will come to me and, and uh, uh, get wrong conclusions and I'm the one being, uh, being taken in instead of the real criminal. Yeah, being suspected for the wrong things. Yes, the police makes a lot of mistakes and they already do now with data that's available. A lot of times in the Netherlands we had um, uh, things on Twitter where, where people or the police uh, went after certain people for things they said. And uh, while people were tweeting that the police was on at, at their door, other people were smart enough to find out that, that police was there for a wrong reason because they could read it on Twitter. So if the police was smart enough to check out more context, they wouldn't make these mistakes. I want to bring this to the following thought. If we go to a post-privacy world where all the information, our locations, everything we do are available for, for everyone, then, uh, for example, the police and actually everyone has enough context to make better decisions and create better innovations as well. 
that sounds very scary if all our information is out there, I'm sure. But another uh, beautiful thought in that, and that co th this also uh, connects to your idea of um, having uh, people shown who actually reads or uses certain information. Because if we know everything of everyone and what they are doing, we also know who is checking out our private information. So I know, okay, for example, Ludo is checking out on what, where I'm going or where I went today. That's a bit scary, so I can talk to Ludo about it. And um, then Ludo knows, oh, uh, Robert has been checking out what, I, what I've been doing on his profile. <laughs> so it gets very complicated, but what happens, there starts to exist a kind of cold war of information because we all know what the other one knows. And um, what happened with the Cold War, it, it never yeah. got to a war. No, exactly. So this is the beautiful thing about information, if you have enough of it. So just a thought. Thank you. I have Nina first. Then we have a question, and then I come to you, Mike. OK, maybe just short, because I can see that the public is eager to participate as well. Also, to throw something at the table, uh, put it on the table. As Ariel was mentioning, transparency by, um, or trust by transparency, and transparency being uh, uh, transparent about your interests, about your objectives, you also have a form of transpar or transparency, a trust that is actually built on knowing that the other has the capabilities and the capacity to protect information, to, um, to share information in, uh, in a protected environment, so maybe just the, the, the building of capabilities of your partners, so abroad your external partners from government, abroad your, uh, or nationally, the, your, your private partners, uh, but also um, uh, academia. You need to know that uh, whatever information you share can be trusted with a party because they have the correct capabilities. What about that? Just a couple more points on transparency. Um, Microsoft believes really strongly in transparency. We have a transparency report that we put out periodically, and we're actually now suing the government because we want to be more transparent, and their classification rules are preventing us from doing that. Some of our customers want to be more transparent, and because of poorly designed regulation, they're not able to share the information they want to share with their customers. So there's some need for reforming government regulations that, that get in the way of some of the sharing. Often there are regulations that are there for a good purpose, whether it's national security or law enforcement or privacy, but they're just not implemented well. They're written so vaguely that lawyers will always overcompensate and hold back information that should be shared. The, the point about the Cold War is interesting. The, the, the phrase mutually assured disclosure comes from the Cold War. But there's another thing I'd point to. There's a, a wonderful book by David Brin. I, I don't agree with everything in the book, but it's called The Transparent Society. It's a little over 10 years old, and he's very utopian. He has this picture of a world where we all know everything about everybody, and that's a good thing. Again, I don't agree with it entirely, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thought-provoking book that gets you to think about how extreme transparency could lead to extreme awareness and lead to extreme, extreme responsibility. Uh, and, and perhaps some of the things in that book are already coming true. Thank you. We have a question. Please uh, uh, state your name and affiliation. Hello, I'm Paul Fillinger from the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, which is a global multi-stakeholder dialogue process to address um, the tension between the cross-border nature of the Internet and geographically defined national jurisdictions. Um, the discussion about transparency was, was um, very interesting, and I think there's an important um, distinction that you also alluded to, but um, I think it's important to stress this. There are two notions of transparency. On the one hand, there's the static transparency that we're talking about, um, when we mention transparency reports, so we have numbers of requests and so on and so forth. But I think what you mainly talked about is um, a sort of procedural transparency, that there are clear that there is a transparency of how things work, how relations work, how requests are really rooted between the different partners, how is um, fair process ensured, what are the appropriate safeguards and procedures within the system. And um, uh, the question to the panel is the following. Um, the title is Breaking Down Silos. And um, in the beginning, you started to talk a lot about public-private cooperation. And it sounded as if you would talk about public-private cooperation within the board of national jurisdictions. Um, I'm wondering, within, how does this apply in the transnational context? Because most online interactions have a transnational 
dimension because they involve maybe even simultaneously multiple jurisdictions due to the location of the server, the location of the CCTLD um, use, the location of the platform use, the um, location of the user, and so on and so forth. So how does this cooperation work in a transnational um, context? Thank you. That is exactly my next question, so thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> you the so that, so that, I think that's right. I think summing up what we said, that, that trust comes into when you talk nationally. For you, ADL, it's somewhat different because you're working with 54 different jurisdictions. But how, how does it happen when something comes from abroad, Martin? Or, or Chris, how do you envision the borders and sharing data? Uh, well, well, it happens through a, a number of different mechanisms, and I think we need to continue to strengthen all of those. So uh, there is increased sharing of information between law enforcement authorities that's gotten better over the years, but it's not perfect at this point. Uh, and there's several ways that's done. Uh, one is through uh, a, a networks have been set up, like the 24-7 network, which now has about 60 countries in it. Uh, and that can be a fast, free, slow thaw, if you will, it, it, at least make sure that the data is available and preserved so that you can go through the process of actually uh, exchanging it. And, and increasingly, I think jurisdictions are doing joint investigations, which allows a much more uh, easy and robust sharing of information back and forth between those authorities. The other thing is the technical community, the CERT community, has become much better. Now, certainly there's organizations like FIRST, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, which is not just government certs, but it's government and private sector certs, and that's been a while, along for a while, and that's increased sharing. But the increasingly countries have uh, created dedicated national certs, and indeed that's one of the things that we've said should be part of a national strategy as, company, as countries look at this issue. And those certs have been very good at cooperating back and forth. And I'll give you one example. Um, uh, and there's also a diplomatic aspect to this, too. Uh, I think everyone knows that, that the U.S. Uh, financial, uh, uh, financial institutions have been subject over the last year uh, to a number of denial of service attacks, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Well, one of the things that we did to, to mitigate that attack is we went to uh, our U.S. CERT, uh, went to their counterparts, where there were counterparts, in some countries there weren't, we had to use other channels, uh, and asked for um, uh, sharing or, or help in mitigating the threat because, you know, botnet is just uh, compromised computers anywhere in the world and that the concentration of those bots, even though the actor who was launching those bots was somewhere else, the concentration of those bots could be anywhere. And sometimes there was a concentration in Germany and sometimes there was a concentration somewhere else. So over time, there were requests, technical requests made to about 100 different countries say, can you do what you could do under your domestic law to help mitigate that? In some countries, it's simply asking the ISPs. In some countries, they have other mechanisms, legal mechanisms in place. But the thing we did that was different is that we also had, um, you know, I've been at the State Department now two years, and there's this diplomatic tool called a demarche. And that always seemed really nasty to me. A demarche always seemed like it would be like, you know, yelling at someone. Well, it's not you could have a positive demarche. And the positive demarche is we sent, uh, we had our embassy go and contact um, the policy making people in those countries and say, look, you know, you get these technical requests from us all the time. This one's really important. Could you really help us out? And that was meant to build this uh, norm, if you will, of better cooperation internationally on some of these issues. Um, and, and, this, and we asked for cooperation from lots of different countries, including countries that sometimes we don't get along with. So it was important to try to build that cooperation against this third-party threat, uh, and we had a lot of success with that. And, of course, we have to be willing to respond if those countries ask us as well. And then there's a third part of the dimension, which is how do you bring the other stakeholders, the private sector and the others involved in that. And I think, you know, traditionally and probably still the way that's most done is the, uh, the government entities are talking to each other, and they're responsible for reaching out to the private sector entities in their jurisdiction. Uh, but that gets a little messy when a lot of private sector entities are cross-jurisdictional, and so we have to have better ways of dealing with that. So I think we're better off now than we were even last year, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Thanks. I think what you started out with, you have, you have the police silo, and you have the search silo, and the private silo. and that Except for I'd say even in, the, you know, in even those silos we've seen breaking down because right. 
you know, years ago, one of the things we launched in the first is we had the law enforcement community come in and give some workshops to the first community. And when it started, the first community was like, you know, those law enforcement guys don't really trust them. Uh, don't know what they do. Seems kind of weird to me. Not sure what it is. And the CERT community was, uh, well, that's the CERT community. And then the, the law enforcement community is like, who are these guys? You know, who are these, the, these tech heads who are dealing with it? And there really wasn't a lot of understanding. So having these workshops where they got together, the first one was remarkable. This is like six years ago now where literally people were getting in the room and it was very standoffish. And now they've done them every time they get together and they're, they're, cooperat they're cooperating on cases, they're working on ways to share information between the certs and law enforcement and vice versa, and that's a good thing. Uh, so there are ways to break down silos, you just have to keep at it. Like, like the IGF is doing, for example. Athena, you have a question. Yes, hello, I'm Athena Fraguli from RIPE NCC. Um, we are the registry for uh, Internet Number Resources, and we're based in the Netherlands. Um, and talking about transparency and sharing of information, uh, we have an experience on that. And I've, I've recently, um, we received more and more uh, requests for information by LEAs. And um, LEAs not just based uh, in the Netherlands, but also based in other areas within our uh, um, region. We, we allocate addresses, and we have members uh, uh, in Europe, in Middle East, in Central Asia, so we receive uh, all kinds of uh, requests from different authorities. And uh, we had um, an issue with our members because they were feeling very uncomfortable because, um, uh, well, in the beginning they were saying, okay, you, you don't share, you're never going to share our private information, will you? And we said, well, sometimes we have to if we are... Um, if, if we receive an order or if we receive a request from someone that has the authority to have this information. And they were feeling very uncomfortable with that. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, LEAs uh, asking for information without uh, the appropriate authority. And uh, we were telling them, well, we cannot give you this information. And the, un the answer was, oh, don't you want uh, to help catch a criminal? Is this what you're doing? Um, so we were a little bit in the middle. And um, we, uh, the, the solution we found appropriate was to uh, publish uh, a document, a procedure, where we clearly say what kind of information uh, we're going to share with uh, law enforcement authorities under what circumstances. And that was very much appreciated by the members and also, I think, by uh, the law enforcement uh, community. And so a, a second thing we did um, in terms of uh, transparency we published uh, a report um, where we give uh, like uh, statistical information um, of uh, where this request comes from, what kind of information they're asking for, and uh, how we handle uh, this request. And that was also uh, very helpful, I think, for the membership. Thank you. I think that's a great example of how you work with, gov with law enforcement and government. You, of course, have your roundtables. But on the other hand, also, for a while, had something called the Cybercrime Working Party, which actually brought the community together with law enforcement. And once they start talking to each other, the discussion just changed from hostile to friendly. And now there's this document that actually everybody seems to be happy with. So that's an example of multi-stakeholderism at the local regional level. I saw a hand, I think, from the remote participation or no? OK. Then, uh, okay, Ludo, then I'll go back to Martin. Thank you. My name is Ludo Kaiser from the Netherlands. What a surprise. Um, I, I'm coming from a total different background, I guess. I work with either, I used to work with youth participation a lot, and the last couple of years I stepped into corporate uh, leadership development. Uh, but when you work with the, the big, companies, uh, the big top 500 corporates. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, different stakeholders in there. Basically, when you have to do a leadership development process, it's about multi-stakeholderism. Um, and um, one thing that I want to make clear, um, what I see as a difference, or in many cases where it goes wrong in, in, in this area that we are talking about right now, uh, is that you know, uh, multi-stakeholderism and, and breaking down silos is always based upon mutual interest. Now, the mutual interest is, is there as well. Uh, but you mentioned trust as one of the key elements in that process. Well, trust will never be there 
as long as it's not result-based. And the last couple of years, unfortunately, in the media, especially, the trust uh, has been gone because the results weren't there yet. So, I mean, at the end, uh, I think all of us, coming from each silo, uh, we have to just, you know, look ourselves in the eyes a little bit and see that we messed up a little bit at a lot of points. We need to get better results to build more trust so that, you know, uh, society in general will actually uh, give uh, more trust and more faith in that process of building down the, of, of breaking down those silos. Uh, so I would strongly um, encourage everybody. I'm not, I'm not directing that at you. I just, you know, uh, wanted to share this idea, I guess, um, of, um, of, of, you know, putting a little bit more pressure onto ourselves to really deliver the added value to the society. As long as there's no added value, there's no result, and no, there's not enough people that will support this process of multi-stakeholderism. So at the end, we have to look at ourselves and see, okay, we should have done better, and we need to do better. And at the end, that's what we need to organize. That's, what, that's a process that we need to facilitate with all of us. And at this point, you know, honestly, we all know it makes sense, what we are saying, but the output is not there enough yet. And in my opinion, that's one of the biggest problems. In corporate settings, if there's profit, that's the output, and there's trust. In this setting, it, won't, it will not be about profit, but the result and the output should be way more clear. Okay, th thank you, Ludo. Mike, you want to respond? Just a couple of quick points. Uh, I'm so glad you're in the leadership business because that was one of the six words I wanted to get to. Having leaders in an organization or a company that understand the need for transparency and information sharing is probably the most important thing. Having a leader who will back up the lower level employee who shares just too much information and causes some trouble, that's a really important. And, and unfortunately, most CEOs are still, because of legal constraints and PR constraints, they're still not willing to back up transparency. They're not willing to, 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 to really say, yeah, that person may have done the wrong thing, but they were doing it for the right reason. The other point that I wanted to make, and this is going to be a little outrageous, is I, I think a lot of people do understand that the IT industry is doing okay on cybersecurity. We're not doing great. But the phrase you know, "digital 9/11" has been around for 10 has been around for 13 years. The phrase "digital Pearl Harbor" has been a lot, around a lot longer, and we haven't had one. I mean, we really are stumbling along, building, making better, more secure software. Microsoft has come an incredible <laughs> way in the last 10 years, partly because of the leadership. Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer both made it clear this was priority number one, and they set up the Trustworthy Computing Initiative, which is now 800 people. They redefined the, the, the reward structure for the developers, and as a result, we now have much more secure systems being shipped by Microsoft. But that leadership was really important there. The leadership is really important on the transparency side. So thank you for bringing leadership into the discussion. Well, um, I'd like to, to stay with you, Mike, if possible, because Microsoft is also doing something like the digital, digital crime unit. They also do something like the security team that just goes out in the world when, when there's a crisis somewhere and helps. That's not something that brings in money directly. Uh, it doesn't bring it in directly, but certainly having customers who trust us is worth a huge amount. I'm, I'm part of a, a very interesting group that studies the relationship economy. At every two weeks we do these conference calls exploring how companies need to do things that don't get reflected in the bottom line. And that's a great example. You know, working with national governments to solve problems like child trafficking or child pornography, that's just the right thing to do. And it, it's good both because it is what a good company should do. It's also, on the bottom line side, something that attracts good employees to our company. As I say, I just joined the company two months ago. And it was things like that 
that convinced me that Microsoft was the right place for me to go at this point in my career. If you go down to showing leadership, like Lido said, and let's expand on that a little bit. For all of you for which it's applicable, what silo would you want to break down at this moment? What would you like to change when it's on cooperation, whether with whoever, as long as it's with this topic, of course? Like, would you like to start, Chris, and then we'll go down the line? Who would you, what silo do you want to break down this year that would make the internet more secure? I mean, that, that's, a, that's obviously a tough question. I, I guess I would like to see uh, more, uh, more discussions, more coordination between the security community. Before, I mean, I, if I asked this a couple of years ago, I'd say between the security community and the technical community, but I think that's happening. But, but I also think it's uh, between the security and technical community and the community of people who rely on these technologies, particularly the economic community. So one of the things I think was interesting this last year uh, in terms of uh, President Obama raising the, the issue of intrusions into computer systems and theft of trade secrets and other intellectual property is a few years ago, so that, if that was raised and people thought that as a security issue, they would have said, well, you know, it's a security issue, I should pay attention to it, and they kind of let it go. But the reason it's taken hold in our country, and because, and the reason it's been such a big issue in our relations with, with some other countries, and I think it's really become a big issue for countries around the world, is it's seen not just as a security issue, but an economic issue. Uh, and I think, you know, when you talk to people who talk about internet policy, including in forums like this, there are people who talk about internet policy and use the term the internet, and there are people who talk about security policy and use the term cyberspace. So part of it is just bringing those communities together so that they all see that they have the same goals and they work together to achieve them. So I think there's some stovepipe breaking down that needs to be done there. Thank you. <clears throat> well, um, I have a developer background as well and I get very uh, excited from certain data. And I was thinking about what kind of data would I use. And the, I mean, I'm not a big corporation and I'm not uh, uh, neither am I a government. Um, so I'm thinking from, from a startup perspective, from a small company, which kind of data would uh, impact, um, uh, would be useful for me to actually build a business upon and give people a, a, better, um, a better experience on that certain data or give them helpful insights as well. Because that is also where we're going in, in the next couple of years, data-driven uh, services. Um, and I couldn't answer that. So the problem is there are so many companies that have so many valuable information. The government has so many valuable information, but they're not even thinking about sharing it or making I'm not talking about open data. I'm talking about accessible data um, built upon mutual interest, of course. Um, so the fr I, um, there's not really like one silo thing. It's, it's more about the, the, the yeah, just a, a culture change that needs to be happening in, in especially uh, larger organizations like corporates and like the government. Yeah, it's a difficult one from my point of view because well, I'm not really, I'm more like a politician, so I'm thinking in all different ways sometimes. But what I really would like to see is uh, more, even more people working together. So we already started that in Holland. Uh, we brought together the government with the industry and the knowledge centers and uh, universities. They all talk together. Maybe we should, maybe the last silo is stop talking and start building. Maybe that's, but no silo, but <laughs> building in a good way. So that would be my wish for next year. I'm going to say something outrageous again, or at least confusing. I want to knock down the information sharing silos. And by that I mean these organizations that are being set up to be the, the, the one-stop shopping source of all information on uh, cybersecurity problems. And we, we see this in some cases where rather than facilitating many-to-many -many communications, so everybody's talking to everybody, they've either done one of two things. They've either 
required everybody to set up these bilateral arrangements where you know, okay, you, you, person A talks to person B, and person A talks to person C, and there's all this elaborate negotiation that goes on one group at a time. Rather than just putting all the data into something like Facebook, which isn't a bad model for this, where everybody puts their own data up there and it's shared. The problem is we do see government agencies that like the Facebook model, but they want to be the gatekeeper before things are put onto this pooled source of information. Both the gatekeeper of what gets up there and then the gatekeeper of who can get in. And that, that, that's not going to work. It's not what works for the hackers. They don't have somebody controlling the information flow. They're out there many-to-many -many communication. They're sharing information back and forth at light speed. And we've got to learn from them. There's a, a, I think most of us on the panel know about this book, but there's a very famous book by John Aquila. It's about 15 years old now on net war. And it, it takes a network to, build, to beat a network. And that's the, the bumper sticker from that book. And it's still true today. It's even more true today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> main silo that I would like to see break is the, um, this, the, the, the one based on trust. We need to work together to build trust, to make, to make you know, the environment trustworthy. And that means genuinely fighting uh, 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 cyber crime. When I say genuinely, is moving from talking, uh, uh, conceptualizing to acting. And, and putting things together. I will add to that we have also to stop thinking about the internet as this wonderful, beautiful tool that we use. Internet is becoming part of our life. It's completely changing the game of the, the way we live. And that, that's put in front of us very hard question. Probably it's, it's not more very hard in, in, in some developed country like the US where internet has a lot of but in many places elsewhere, it, it, it's raising some very, very important questions. You know, and we need to address them to, to bring trust back. And that's important. Thank you. Um, what I think that we need to break down, I don't know. We've developed from, a, from the policy perspective, we've, we've developed from a cyber crime uh, glosses to cybersecurity to cyberspace, actually, because we're not just talking about security. There is the economic benefits of uh, our techn technological advan uh, advance, and uh, on the other, s on the, on the, within the triangle, you also have the freedom side of uh, the opportunities that it provides the, in the individual um, user of internet or uh, other technological means. I think within this triangle. There are silos, silos for a reason as well. There are different interests. There are very valid interests. And we should share information. We should be transparent on those um, interests and objectives. But at a certain point, I do uh, like to uh, respect or I, I, those silos are there for a reason. And um, <laughs> well, it depends on what you, what you see as a silo. Cause uh, I, if we're talking from the government, if we're talking with private companies that share their information with us, they're are asking us as well for the competitive uh, advantage or the competitive relationship they have that we don't share all the information that we get from them. So there's a really good reason not to share certain information to share, for example, anonymous data uh, instead. So I, I do think that there are reasons for this and we should uh, respect those as well. Well, that something along the lines that you said in May, Martin, that yeah. should you break down silos or make it them accessible to others at the right time? Yeah, exactly. That, uh, thank you sorry. for taking my point. Uh, <laughs> for me, summarizing it, uh, sorry. Yeah, um, leave nothing for me. So I'll come up with something else. Um, <laughs> no, but it's true. I, I'm uh, breaking down the silos, yes, but as far as it, ne it is necessary. And it's, it's not necessary to break them down to the ground. So um, what one of the things I, I myself notice is we're a private entity. We're 
not for profit, so maybe we're a bit different from from for profit companies. But what I hear in uh, we we uh, work together with uh, Dutch Net National uh, Cybersecurity uh, Council, and uh, one of my colleagues goes there. Uh, I think once a week or once two weeks. I don't know. And um, what I hear back from him is that he is there and he, and he shares everything because we're a very open company. Um, but that as soon as it, um, he wants to share a lot and government sometimes wants to share also. You see the people want to share, but then they have to go back to their lawyers. And I'm a lawyer myself, but I think you can share a lot. Don't be afraid. So maybe we should just bring the, the silo of lawyers down or something. <laughs> there, there are two types of lawyers in Washington. There are the type who uh, t tell you what you can't do, and then there are the, those who find a way to let you do what you want to do. And there are a lot fewer of the latter type, so they're much more expensive. And as a result, the government can't hire them. <laughs> But, but I think what, what is good to notice here is that, that there is some sort of a consensus. That is one. But the other one is that the game seems to have changed since we talked last year. Because what, what some are saying, we're, we used to look just at cybercrime. But now we're looking at cyber life, basically. Our lives and the thing called the Internet, which is going to be a part of our lives. And is that actually... And I'm also going to look at the youth first, uh, Robert. Um, do you think the issues on privacy-sensitive data between governments and between borders, is that going to be your issue when you're in, perhaps in government or an institution 10 years from now, or let's say, just pretend, and that you're working there, that it will be the same issue as it is nowadays with lawyers saying, but well, you're not allowed to share data. Will it change? Uh, well, when I'm in... When it depends on me, I would uh, actually work on encouraging people and building trust. And um, the problem with trust, it takes a lot of time to build trust, and it's gone in a split second when someone makes a different uh, makes a mistake. So um, I like to uh, quote Ludo on this. Is what he said: there is a difference between working together or sharing data, privacy, privacy, and personal information built on trust rather than mutual interest or purposeful sharing of your information. So if it comes, if it, if I can put it this way, if people start to understand the purpose of sharing their data, they will um, be more easily uh, sharing their data. So I think this is one of the changes that needs to be happening through awareness, through education. It's like, okay, share your data because it's very useful and then it becomes easier to do it. And that's the exact opposite of what the European Commission has did this moment doing with sharing data. They make trying to restrict it as much as possible. Yeah, but right now it's the, all the data that's being gathered is not very purposeful. It's, it's being, I mean, it's being gathered for the sake of in ten years it might be useful. And um, in that case, I'm not really, I'm not telling all my all kinds of stories to someone that will leave tomorrow. I won't see him for ten years. And in 10 years, he will remember something. And then maybe, you know, it's the companies that are uh, gathering the information right now don't have a very clear purpose or are not very transparent about it. So that's the difference. OK, thanks. We had a question from Ludo. That's the last question we'll take from the room, unless there's something remote. Um, Yes, uh, I would. I'm gonna try to phrase it in a question. Um, <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, what you just said about the leadership within Microsoft, and I strongly support most of the things happening within Microsoft when it comes to leadership. So I take my hat off for that. But then if we look at police and if we look at the government in general, I'm not seeing that leadership in there at all. Uh, so when Robert is talking about, you know, uh, crime-related data uh, sharing, for example, I mean, you need to trust the police for that. The police needs to take some sort of a leadership. Now, we had a beautiful example in Holland. Um, it was called the Haren case. It's definitely worthwhile looking into. 
a couple of youngsters who tried to, uh, they set up a Facebook event. And the Facebook event became huge, and a lot of kids went to Hare, and they broke this, the little village down completely. Why did they break it down? Because there was no strong um, leadership from the police or the government to say to how to deal with it, basically. Uh, that's an issue right there. Uh, when it comes to the reaction from the whole globe, when it comes to Snowden, the whistleblower, and nobody stands up for him besides Russia? I mean, really? And I understand all the bilateral um, agreements we have with the USA when it comes to Holland, but there are some Dutch representatives here from the government, and, you know, I, I'm not afraid, actually, to attack my own nest when it comes to that. If, if we have the International Court of Law in Holland, and we are fighting for equality and fighting for transparency, we need to step up. And then, I'm sorry... But then we should uh, headbutt the U.S. maybe a little bit and, uh, and just, you know, step up and say, you know, we're going to take care of this. So I would like to hear from you, how can we get, that's the question, huh? I would like to hear from you, how can we get more leadership in those type of areas? How, what would your suggestions be? Okay. Chris, I'm sorry, but I'm going to start with you on this. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I thought he was asking for leadership in the Dutch government. Oh, look, <laughs> Look, I, I think there has been leadership that's been shown. Uh, President Obama set up a commission of, of people to look at these policies, uh, and their, their work is underway, and that's important. And I think that I think one of the things that I've seen that, that concerns me is that uh, some of the issues around uh, intelligence gathering for purposes of protecting not just uh, U.S. citizens but other countries around the world, including the Netherlands, uh, gets um, confused with uh, targeting uh, citizens for their political views or is deliberately confused by some more repressive regimes uh, where they try to make, take advantage of that to advance uh, you know, much uh, you know, things that are really, I think, uh, underlie uh, some of the concerns of the Internet, like tries to block freedom of expression on the Internet, tries to block the multi-stakeholder governance system, and I don't think we can let that happen. So I think we really need to be clear about what we're talking about and clear about those solutions. That's one. Then we go to the Dutch government, to the parliament. In what way could the parliament have shown leadership, or would you have expected the government or the, the, the LEAs to show leadership on the, the Haren case, which will explain offline uh, a little more if necessary? Well, first of all, this was a local issue, so you can talk about leadership from the government, but it started in a town, so the one to talk about is the mayor of the town. I think he's... He left now? No? Oh. Okay, no, let's, not, let's not debate that. Uh, no, but if you talk about leadership and then you say uh, who's responsible and then you say the government is, I'm really a critical person also on the government, but in this case I would say, well, it was the ma uh, mayor. It's, local things should be arranged local and uh, 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 stuff from the whole Netherlands should be done in, in, in leadership. And Snowden, I agree. I was mad to, and I wanted my minister to, to speak out more. And then they said, and then you get this political thing. Because we also need to, uh, how you say, oh, it's sometimes I <laughs> demand. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's going to be on the internet forever, no. Alsa, okay. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> can we strike uh, that Dutch You still uh, have to work together. That's, we can uh, uh, become very mad and start screaming and shouting, and I can do that as a member of parliament, but I think when you're in a minister, you have to talk to the other part. I don't know what they said to America or to the ambassador. They told us, uh, they talked to each other, so... That's my, uh, that's my uh, job. I have to ask, what did you do? And they say, I did this. And this is the trust thing again. So I have to trust that they did what they told me they did. So. Well, I want to quickly comment on leadership and acting the government in the case of the Hare, mm -hmm. project, project X case, to be more clear to other people, describes the, uh, the scene a bit better. Leadership is not about pointing the finger to the one responsible. So it's about when, when it becomes a public issue, leadership comes to a government 
people standing up, not feeling responsible, but feeling, hey, something needs to change here and we are the one to do it. Where it's someone else's responsibility, we still need to change it. Yeah, but then I didn't understand the question quite right because I thought it was about her and how it started and uh, the way it started. It started on Facebook and then after that, and then the government took his uh, uh, leadership because they said... We what was the leadership they took? They did what they had to do. Well, okay. it okay. is uh, lead, lead this on, more... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm okay. Go, I'm going this to do... We're yeah, going take this, back, we're going to take it back to the Netherlands. This is a local work. issue, but if you talk about, I'm not sure how leadership came in, but I, all I want to say, it's not about finger pointing, but it's if something starts on Facebook, and then uh, finally you blame the government. I'm not sure, but maybe we should d just go back to where uh, the discussion is about uh, breaking down silos. Which I takes, thought. Which takes leadership. Which takes leadership, and then you should do that. But, well, I'm not sure how Haren came in, but, <laughs> and the Project X, but, and besides that, I'm not the government. Mm -hmm. So you can talk to me and say, I, but I'm not a leader, or well, something well, like that. But <laughs> I think that that particular question has been yeah. addressed enough, I think, I unless, uh, Nina, uh, unless yeah. you want I to reflect. If we may just reflect a bit, it's also about how do you define leadership or what, what do you think uh, is leadership? I think leadership is learning from your mistakes and being transparent about that. Yeah. We've done evaluations on several mistakes that are maybe uh, part, partly government, partly the responsibility of other partners as well, of individuals even. Uh, when do you show leadership? I think when you discuss things, when you uh, uh, talk to your partners that have made mistakes and uh, try to find out what went wrong and what, how are we going to resolve this. So this is, uh, you can look at it from individual or uh, individual cases. Uh, you can also try to create an environment in which you can share this this information more easily. That's what we've been trying in the Netherlands to do with creating a cybersecurity council. Um, there are several um, uh, multi-stakeholder players at really sea level that do share experiences. They do share their ex uh, mistakes and they hope they can actually resolve them before they have a next uh, yeah, uh, event or incident that actually uh, can concern all of us. Okay, thank you. I think we're running out of time at 6 o'clock. We're going to have one final round of recommendations. Um, just to wrap up before you can give your recommendation, I think we heard some excellent examples here on how actually people are working on breaking down silos. We hear about the domain name registry of the Netherlands working with ISPs to tackle botnets. We hear about the National Cybersecurity Council and the National Cybersecurity uh, Com Committee that's actually bringing all these different stakeholders together to work on. I think somebody still really wants to say something, but I'll wrap up and then I'll give rule of the mic and then I'll give you re recommendations. Um, this, you know, before you shoot me again, uh, yes. I'll <laughs> but we heard from US SIRs working together with, with law enforcement for years, the, G the G7 uh, network that was expanding in the world on cooperation with law enforcement crossing borders. So in other words, ADL is working with 54 different African nations and ISPs from 54 different nations in law enforcement. I think there's some excellent examples, and we heard about ACDC. So a lot is happening, and I think that is the right, the right conclusion. That's why we want to bring all these examples here to, together at the table, and I thank you for that. I'll let Rulof re reflect or ask a question, and then I'm going to ask you each for your recommendations on the, the future. Since this whole thing is about breaking down silos, I'll, I'll come up with um, something I often see happening, and I think it's the best way to make sure that you don't break down silos. And it's the combination of, on one hand, saying to governments, governments, you're just stakeholders, get in line with all the others and discuss with us, and together we will come up with a solution, and then if something goes wrong, you blame the government. <laughs> That's the best way to make sure that governments create silos and that they start to regulate. Um, and I think it's not fair that if something goes wrong, if it's the internet or not, and a lot of people are involved, that, and it's what we always do. If there goes something wrong in the final sector, we say, ah, there wasn't enough supervision of the banks. 
it's one of the most regulated industries that we have. Um, so I think we should, first of all, blame the banks, for instance. And here we should blame those people that broke down the village first before we blame the government. Um, so that was my point. You could continue that with other examples, uh, uh, I suppose, which the point makes. Thank you. Um, some, somebody in here in this room also said once that, that when we discuss these sort of topics, it seems that also that we just discuss it, but usually we go home, and there seems to be some sort of a glass ceiling that we never break through. And the question is here, are these examples examples that show that there are some bursts in the, in the glass ceiling that may actually eventually break? We'll see that in the future, and perhaps with your recommendations, which we'll this time start with Martin and work towards Chris, and, uh, and see if your recommendation can help to push that, that glass ceiling further away. So what would you, on breaking down silos, like to see happening next year, or two years? Martin. Well, um, the thing is, the, the glass ceiling is, is, is still there, and I, I don't think, and it will be very difficult to, to get it away, because it, it, you most often see it in, in international environments. I think you can do a lot, and there's a lot done probably in many countries locally, because that's easy. You know each other, you're in the same jurisdiction, because, again, legal stuff plays a role. Um, and I think, in, in, at least in the Netherlands, that goes quite good. We, we talk to each other, we uh, seem to understand each other, we seem to, the, the government seems to understand much more what the internet is, what the players in the internet are, what, what they can and what they can't. And um, so, go on. But I have no solution for the international thing, because that's serious, difficult. Well, we're already over time, so I'll just be quite short. I think whenever you come across, I'll just take it to a recommendation, I guess, or a takeaway maybe for every one of us. Whenever you as an individual or organization come across uh, any silo that you feel should be broken, just uh, start the uh, conversation, start working small. That's how you build your trust, and then stay thinking big, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as takeaway, not recommendation, but takeaway, I would say, <coughs> I would say um, let work the talk. Uh, meaning um, um, we, we, we should address those issues of cyber crime, cyber security, <coughs> and sharing of, of information with serious and diligence, meaning we, we need to act on those things immediately and, and, and with the aim at clear result at the end, not just it. Because the ceiling will always be there, and that's why we gather here for one week to talk about multi-stakeholdering, because uh, those complex issues can only be addressed to, through, I mean, participation from everybody. If the silo are there, it, it won't work. So we have to be more diligent about this. We, we need to um, work the top. Thanks for giving us one last round. Uh, I came in here with six words I wanted to use. Declassification, transparency, accountability, motivation, leadership, but I didn't get to use the sixth, which you just used, future. And the, one of the best ways to break down silos is to come up with an emerging technology that gets everybody excited about working together to use it. When I was in the Clinton White House, it was the web just knocked down all the silos. It was great. The cloud is doing the same thing now. And there's a couple technologies in the arena of cybersecurity that I think could help us do that, could motivate people to work together to find new solutions. I also learned a seventh word, which I particularly like, poldering. <laughs> and I'm going to take that home. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, well, the glass ceiling, uh, we all know as women, so maybe <laughs> I should uh, look at it that way. But uh, what I will take along, again, is the way we should look at Internet, but also at data, at open data, at transparency, and the way we should talk to each other and not blaming each other, but uh, keep, on, keep the conversation going. That's the only way to build up trust again. So that's, I keep it with trust. That's, uh, 
Uh, when we want to take away this glass ceiling, um, I, th I, I think it's not the glass ceiling. I think it's the actual uh, ceiling where you can't look through because um, it's, it's not transparent. It's not transparent, not in that way about data. But there isn't a clear vision. There is, isn't a dream or, or uh, a purposeful thing why we need to break the silos uh, down yet. So my recommendation will be get people motivated, get them fried up to, to work their asses off to break down these silos because in the end, if you see what you're working for and if you see the opportunities of breaking down these silos and if you can look into the future and dream about all the beautiful things that will happen, um, when we break those, down these silos, the ceiling will become of glass and eventually it won't be there anymore. Okay, okay I'm not going to talk about a glass ceiling at all. Uh, <laughs> and instead, I'll, I'll just focus on two things. One, building these better cooperative networks to deal with uh, common threats. And, and, and I mentioned that a little bit with the uh, DDoS attacks and botnets. And I think that's something that we can use for all kinds of threats. Um, and it's not just the technical community, but getting the political level involved, too. The, the other is uh, something we really haven't talked about today, which is um, the, there's also a lot of silos within governments, uh, you know, just those stakeholders where different agencies in the same government may have no idea what the other one is doing. So one great way to break down th that silo is exactly what the Netherlands is doing, which is to have a national strategy that forces all those stakeholders and stakeholders outside the government to come together. And, and, you know, they might actually talk to each other, and that might actually help them coordinate better. And so one of the things we've done in the last year, uh, especially, is I have a lot of all-of-government dialogues with other countries, um, uh, India, Brazil, South Africa, Korea, Japan, and, and uh, recently China, for instance. Uh, and we say those should be all of government. So we have all the different agencies, the civilian agencies, the commerce agencies, the security agencies, the justice ministries, the defense agencies, and we expect them to have the same on their side, and that really helps the discussion work much better. And frankly, sometimes the first time those agencies are talking to each other is when they come to a meeting like that, so it's important. I have exactly the same uh, the experience. When the first time we, I personally organized such a meeting, and everybody was sitting like this, there's a very scary person sitting there from another agency, but heck, there's another one there. So they didn't know where to go. And it took three meetings before people started talking to each other on content. And from there on, uh, now we, it's in the National Cybersecurity Center. So in other words, it, it, that's the way forward. That's just my little personal experience at the end. But um, I want to thank my, my panelists for an excellent, excellent discussion on, on this topic. I'm afraid the room was a bit empty, for which I apologize. But we had this very weird session, the, the title, as you understand, and, and it was a bit of a Dutch party. Also, thank you for, for asking questions. Thanks to our people scribing, reporting, and watching for um, no uh, remote participation, but thank you for watching all the time. Okay, and uh, thank you for being in the room, and I'd like a big, big hand for, uh, for our panelists. Thank you.